I now invite you to look with me at the gospel according to Matthew in the sixth chapter, verses 5 through 13. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. God, as we continue to explore the gift of prayer, and especially how it was embodied and practiced by your son, Jesus Christ, may your spirit teach us in new ways the importance of prayer and how we can model our lives after our Lord and Savior. And so open us up to new discoveries, challenge us, nurture us, strengthen us. May the words of my mouth and meditations of all our hearts this day be pleasing and acceptable to you, our Lord, our Rock, our Redeemer. Amen. Some of you know the story of Socrates, one of the great thinkers in history And a young, pompous, would-be student, and this arrogant student, this youth, comes up to Socrates one day and says, oh, great teacher, I want knowledge. And Socrates replies, why don't you come with me? Now, he doesn't really like this guy on the front end, so he takes him to the ocean, walks him out to the water, and asks, what do you want? And the young man answers, I want knowledge, oh, great Socrates. Then Socrates grabs him and pushes him under the water and holds him there for 30 seconds. When he brings up the young man from the water, he then asks, what do you want? And the young man responds, I want knowledge, oh great Socrates. Immediately, Socrates grabs him again and holds him under water for 40 seconds. The guy comes up, a little bit shaken this time, thinking he's with a crazy man. And Socrates asks him again, Son, what do you want? Once more, the young man answers, I want knowledge, O great Socrates. Socrates pushes his head under the water yet again, and this time holds him there for 50 seconds. And finally, Socrates pulls him back up and says, Son, what do you want? And this time, the young man replies, I want air. I want knowledge. I want to learn. I love to be challenged. It's important to have our minds stretched. As a dear friend once said to me, there's nothing, there's nothing more tragic than a closed mind. I also want justice. I want to see the world filled with justice. Instead, it seems we we see a, a world filled mostly with injustice. The biblical tradition speaks of a God of Justice and righteousness. Those two words express the same content. A God of justice and righteousness is a God who does what is just by doing what is right and does what is right by doing what is just. And as God's own beloved children, made in the image and likeness of God and redeemed and claimed by Jesus Christ, justice is the air we breathe. 
Do we want that air? If we really want it, then when we pray the prayer the Lord taught us to pray, we better start moving. Over the last few weeks, we've experienced how prayer was an unbroken rhythm in Jesus' life, whether in private or in public. Prayer set the tone for wherever he went, whatever he did, and whomever he did it with. Prayer was always with him and fostered an ease of movement from communication to God to communication with others. And it would be hard to imagine that people didn't notice this about Jesus. In fact, I believe it is because they did notice this about Jesus and how he was always going away to pray or praying with others or praying for others that at some point they flat out requested of him, Lord, teach us to pray. And so we have the Lord's Prayer, the best known prayer in the whole world. The Lord's Prayer, in short, is a summary of what mattered most to Jesus. And what I believe mattered most to Jesus is justice, the justice of telling and showing people that they belong, the justice of loving them when they are unlovable, the justice of instilling hope in them, opening their minds, broadening their perspectives, the justice of teaching them a better way, the justice of giving them knowledge, yes, but also giving them new air to breathe, the justice of inviting them to be a vital part of cramming this earth with heaven. The Lord's Prayer is Christianity's greatest prayer. It is prayed by virtually all Christians, but it never mentions Christ. It is prayed in most, if not all, churches, but it never mentions church. It is prayed on most, if not all, Sundays, but it never mentions Sunday. It is called the Lord's Prayer, but it never mentions the Lord. It is prayed by all different sorts of flavors of Christians on the theological spectrum, but it never mentions any one specific tradition. It is prayed by Christians who focus on the next life, the afterlife of heaven or hell, but it never mentions the next life. It is prayed by Christians who split from one another over this doctrine or that doctrine, but it never mentions a single one of those doctrines. It is prayed by Christians who find its words a familiar comfort, but it is also prayed by Christians who take its familiar words for granted because they are perhaps too familiar. There are three versions of the Lord's Prayer in late first century Christian documents, one in Matthew, one in Luke, and one in the uh, Didache, a writing from around year 100 that's not included in the New Testament. And because of the different versions, scholars over time have become uncertain about whether the prayer goes all the way back to Jesus or whether the versions are products of, of different Christian communities. If Jesus taught his disciples to memorize and embody this prayer, how do we account for the different versions? Did he teach it in different ways on different occasions? Or did he teach the core of it and then the communities then developed it in their own ways? But whether the prayer goes back to Jesus or is the work of his followers or both, it tells us the gist of what they thought mattered most to him. To be committed to Jesus means to pray for, to yearn for, to long for what is in this prayer, the Lord's Prayer. The how and the what of Jesus' prayer life is completely enveloped by the substance, the ingredients of this, the Lord's Prayer. What the Lord's Prayer is not about is the afterlife. What the Lord's Prayer is not about is material success. What the Lord's Prayer is not about is belief. It's not even about the distinctive identity of Jesus Christ. The Lord's Prayer, again, is a summary of what mattered most to Jesus and when we pray this prayer, we are praying for what he was passionate about. And because Jesus is the revelation and embodiment of God, we are praying for what God is passionate about. We are praying 
for God's dream for this world. Not the next world, this world. It is an outline covering the major issues of what prayer is supposed to be in Jesus' own eyes. To pray this prayer is to be invited into something so much bigger than us, yet something that still very much includes and involves us. It is a prayer at the heart of Judaism, prayed by Christians for the heart of the world. It is more revolutionary than we think. It is a hymn of hope for all of humanity, addressed to all the earth. There's a story about a newly appointed pastor who preached a very fine sermon on his first Sunday in the church. The text was from Matthew on how no one can serve two masters. You can't serve in God and money, God and money at the same time. Everyone loved the sermon. The next Sunday he preached the very same sermon. The people were perplexed, but since it was a fine sermon, no one spoke up about the duplication. The next week he preached the same sermon again. After the service, the chairpersons of the personnel and worship committees came to the pastor and asked him why he was preaching the same sermon over and over and over again. The pastor said, when we start doing what Jesus has invited us to do, I'll move on to something new. (laughs) Ouch. It's similar with the Lord's Prayer, I believe. It is surely our greatest prayer. When we know not how to pray, when we think we are unable to pray, we have this prayer to pray. There is certainly knowledge to be found in this prayer the more faithfully faithfully we pray it. We also discover, however, that it is an invitation into a revolution. Its words are the air we breathe. Because the words are the air Jesus breathed and still breathes into you and into me and into this world where something of heaven is desperately trying to find a place. If you and I really mean these words, if we truly pray the Lord's Prayer, then we should expect to be changed. We should also expect to do some changing around us. If that's not what you want, if that's not what you signed up for, then by all means stick with something like St. Augustine's wayward prayer of, Lord, make me pure, but not yet. On the other hand, I believe John Bunyan got it right. You can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until You have prayed. And so we pray, and we keep praying what mattered most to Jesus simply because we are what matters most to Jesus. Amen.